Oh, yeah, get them balls to the wall, man. <laughs> Welcome to the show, folks. This is a Grim there, and you are tuned in to Balls to the Wall. That's right, Freaker's Ball is not tonight because Moose Girl is out on the town having a good time. She didn't say so, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking she got a date. Anyway, she's out at the uh, local pub there watching some kind of baseball thing going on. So, uh, anyway, have fun out there, Moose Girl. We're going to sit here and we're going to do some balls to the wall, man. Yes, indeedy, we are. So, um, I <laughs> forgot to change my camera there. Anyway, uh, hopefully everything stays connected tonight. We are in the midst right here at my house of a massive uh, thunderstorm. You may hear some thunder boomers going on in the background as I go throughout the show because, uh, They've been going on all night, and uh, they don't seem to be uh, lightening up. However, the rain, massive rain and hail, has seemed to move through, and the wind has lessened. However, we still are having that fun, fun light show from the sky. We're in God's bowling alley, as it were, as we hear them, them big bowling balls being rolled over our heads here. <laughs> Smack it into those pins. Yes, indeed. Light show at my house. Uh, anyway, so welcome to everybody out there. This is, by the way, let me mention this real quick here. I should have done this at the top. But it is Friday, July 26, 2019. Last balls to the wall slash freakers ball of July 2019. So, yeah, that's how that's going. Uh, <laughs> next week will be in August. Oh, man. I, you know, I, I hear some weird stuff uh, from some of the, like, on the local radio. Apparently, school. They're starting school in Albuquerque for a lot of the, the kids there. On Monday, the first Monday in August, they're starting school. I don't, I don't know about you. I mean, I'm old. I'm old. Uh, you know, I'm 58 here. Uh, but when I was a child, when I was a child... We didn't start school until after Labor Day, ever. And, uh, you know, uh, here in New Mexico, it gets a bit warm. So I can't imagine uh, those kids sitting in those classrooms if it's 100 degrees out. Not that it's been 100 degrees here, but um, uh, still. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, and then I guess there's, that's a limited amount of the kids that are going to start on the second. And then the other rest of them start two weeks later on the 16th either way middle of august you know that's that's still it's way too early for kids to be going back into school and then it goes longer i think at the end of the year i, I don't it's not like they shaved it off the other end they're just making them do more so whatever and they're coming out stupider <laughs> uh no yeah the uh uh, that's one other thing. The uh, Beth is in the chat here mentioning the uh, back to school stuff, which they've been talking about a lot already. However, here in New Mexico, and I, I'm sure it's the same in other states, I don't know, but they have what they call a tax free weekend for all the back to school stuff. But that doesn't happen until next weekend. So all the kids that are starting back to school on Monday, they won't be able to take advantage if they need supplies for school. Uh, of the tax-free stuff. So, uh, you know, and it includes all kinds of different stuff. You bet all your basic, you know, of course, uh, paper and pencils and notebooks and backpacks and all that stuff all go tax-free, but also your electronics. So if you need to do a laptop for school or calculator or I, I don't know what the kids are using these days, but uh, <laughs> whatever those things are, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a little out of touch with what's going on there in, in those public schools these days. But uh, yeah, they they uh, they're they're gonna miss out if they, if they have to get stuff for the first week of school on the tax free part. Anyhow, uh, I suppose they could uh, go limited on the first week and then go tax free on the you know over the weekend. I don't know. Anyway, let me say hi and howdy to all the folks out there in all the various places that we may be being broadcast to. Of course, the live video stream is here and available on RealLibertyMedia.com. Underneath the show pages there, the Freakers Ball show page. That's right, Balls to the Wall is on the Freakers Ball show page because it's basically Freakers Ball minus Moose Girl. 
you know. <laughs> and, and I've actually kind of been thinking maybe um, just always call it Freaker's Ball instead of Balls to the Wall. I, I don't know. It doesn't really matter one way or the other. It's a different opening song, and there's no moose. Other than that, it's still the same show. So, whatever. Anyway, so uh, hello to the folks over there on realliberty.org. Looks like we got possibly Bob Renner and Grammy Mary. Grammy, you still out there? All right. Uh, yeah, Grammy did a great show earlier talking all about the gardening stuff and how how to grow things in off seasons and how to do mulching and all, all kinds of it was really good stuff. Uh look for her blog post on com tomorrow as I will be posting it tomorrow. Uh yeah. Uh, she already has it up on the spreaker dot com if you're uh, if you can't wait until tomorrow, but you know. <laughs> anyway, Freedoms Network, hi and howdy to y'all over there. I think Estrella is over there and jamming along with us, as well as Grammy Mary, and who knows who else is all over there. Maybe Bob Bo Diddley, some of those other folks. Uh, we post on Minds as well and on Twitter.com. And by the way, uh, howdy Minds folks to anybody that's tuned in there or from Twitter. Uh, uh, Twitter last week, and, and we'll, we'll go ahead and kick off with this, I guess. Uh, Twitter, Twitter last week. Um, they changed their format. They forced all the users onto this new format they have. And it, it's just, it's not good. It's not good for anybody that's used to using Twitter in a, in a certain way. And I don't think it's really good overall. It, the, the, the new setup uh, uses more of your system resources. And you got to scroll and scroll to get to the, the newer tweets. And I, 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 don't, I don't like the layout. I want, I want my stuff in a certain way. And it doesn't look that way anymore. However, being who I am and not liking something, I find a way around it. And then that is exactly what I did with Twitter because I knew, I knew somebody, some creative little mofo out there would have created something cool to make it so that I could continue to use the old version of Twitter. And they have. And it is available for your Mozilla-based browsers. Uh, what did I do there? Your Mozilla-based browsers, uh, su such as Firefox or Waterfox or uh, some of... Why is this not copying? Why is this copy page title and URL? All right, undo that. All right, all right, all right, all right. Paste. Still not, it's not pasting. I don't, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. All right, let me just do a copy page title. Let me see if that works. Um... No, it's not. <laughs> <All right. laughs> My copy page title and URL thing is is not doing what I want here. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, it's called Good Twitter, and um, <laughs> it's available. I'll give you the links to these in a second or two here. Um, but you just install these little plugins on on your browsers. Uh, whatever those browsers happen to be, and, uh, and and it'll work fine. So yeah, if you're using straight Chrome or you're using uh, Opera, I think is is Chrome based now, and Brave is obviously Chrome based. Um, I don't know, obviously, but it is Chrome based, um, and or uh, whatever. Uh, you probably know what you got. Uh, hopefully, if you're using a browser, you hopefully know what you got, and uh, who who made it, who. And, and and so that it's available for you. Um, so either way, if you like the old Twitter and 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 you are using one of these browsers that I mentioned, then go ahead and uh, install this plugin, and you'll be able to use Twitter as you have been accustomed to for many many years now. So there it is. Like I said, it's called Good Twitter, and uh, yeah, check it out. Check it out. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, uh, oh, yeah. Where was that? I said hello to all those folks. I think out there. Uh, howdy to the folks here. This is the main spot that we're in. Um, at least uh, at the present time, that may change from what I hear. Uh, Freenode is also trying to make, or possibly considering talking about making some changes as well, which could force us uh, to a different place. If it does, I think it would be the same place. Minus one one pound sign, so instead of pound pound, Real Liberty Media, 
it would be pound real liberty media as as you know most of the other channels are um so i'll I'll look at that over the weekend and see how we just move over to that anyway might as well get it going if that's the if that's the direction they're wanting to go on freenode and since we've been using freenode all these years uh, i ch- i looked today and I, I i saw the uh this channel that we're in real liberty media here on irc dot freenode dot net is um re- was registered nine and a half years ago um so we've been here. We've been we've been we've been good for a long time. So uh, <laughs> I mean that's quite a while for uh, for any uh, internet entity to hang around. Um, but we, yeah, we've been around. We've been we've been here. Um, <laughs> so anyway, hi and howdy to the folks here. Bar a man, Mister Barman, my bot, uh, Beetle, and myself in the Moose Girl, Don Carroll, and anti Asmo, Miss Beth Z. Uh, Chalcedonian free enslaved Miss Graham Z. Hey, you still awake, Grammy? Uh, we got the Java Doctor in Meister Brow, the Ponderganner slash Vinny there. Uh, Miss Kate. Hey, Kate, how's things going down there in Florida? Uh, is that uh, bathroom thing coming along? Uh, hopefully, bathroom? You get more in the bathroom, right? <laughs> anyway, and we got uh, who was I going to talk about? Java Doctor and Meister Brown. Uh, uh, where was I at here? It was Kate Rome's Vanna White Bot, Vin E again there. Weather Dork, the Phantom of the IRC, Miss Sickle in the Cyborg Noodle, uh, and uh, Siv and Frumpy and Gooberzilla. Hey Goob. What the heck's going on? Mr. Gromit there as well. JJ's Kiss. Um, Bo E. Prince. Bone Sauce, the sock puppet himself. And Smart As. Uh, all hanging out here in the chat room right now on uh, irc.freenode.net, which you can connect to uh, via the reallibertymedia.com page there, or on rlmradio.xyz or using your own IRC chat client, which I recommend heavily, uh, because, you know, um, yeah, I just do. Uh, anyway, like I said, I hope everything stays connected and working and operational tonight, because, you know, these storms tend to interrupt things out here in the boonies where I live. Uh, even though I am on cable, and it's generally a very nice connection, uh, the power out here is not necessarily as good as the... Um, <laughs> cable and see the deal is and I, I've got all my stuff connected up to UPS stuff un- uninterruptible power supply so my stuff won't go off but what goes off when the power flashes is is the router out there outside not my router the, the Comcast router um, <laughs> you know you're a funny one Kate <laughs> Still looking at studs, man, on the throne. Yeah, baby. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, just outside my window at about 50 yards over, there's this big green pole that comes up from the ground that um, runs all of the Internet connections for Comcast. And uh, so when the power flashes, that thing flashes. And when that thing flashes... Uh, internet connections get interrupted. So, hopefully that won't happen this evening. Cross your fingers. I'm crossing mine. Crossing my toes and my eyes. <laughs> anyway, let's get this kicked off with some jams here. Oh, man, it is balls to the wall, man. So, uh, yeah, we're going to kick it off with some uh, some balls to the wall. Let me, let me, let me. Let me quickly, let me quickly change this here so that that reads properly. All right, here we go. Battle Beast. Oh, yeah, very nice, very nice. Billy Blaze there. Uh, The thrill is gone with the Hub City Band. Uh, This is a sock puppet request, and and I should comment, or I should have stated earlier that I am digging deep into the request list this evening. Sock puppet requested that track back in 2017. 
<laughs> around April 2017, he made that request. So, yeah, we eventually get to him. Anyway, before that was uh, Nathaniel Ratliff and the Night Sweats doing their song, S-O-B. And we kicked it off with Battle Beast in their track, Enter the Metal World. So when Gooberzilla said, hey, is that a new band? Uh, not really. I, I mean, it was requested in 2017, but it was actually released on YouTube in May of 2011. So, uh, yeah, it's... Um... <laughs> yeah, so some of, these, some of the tracks I'm going to be playing tonight that are these really old requests, I have no idea what they are uh, because they're from bands that I'm not familiar with. And, and they're just like old and they're in the list um, what, what the hell happened there what happened uh, I don't know I clicked something and I clicked it wrong I don't know what the hell I did but uh, so um, <laughs> so so we, we, so we may have some su surprises here this evening uh, coming our direction uh, so be ready for all that <laughs> Uh, and, and you know I like to do these, and I'll, I'll try and get to some of the newer requests a little later on. Uh, but uh, at, at this point in time, I'm I'm digging back into the 2017 stuff uh, right now, just because it's still in there, and you know it was requested at some point. That means it was probably cool at some point. Good good to hear, you know. Um, I have periodically in the past gone through and eliminated some of the really old requests, but um, I'm trying to get to some of them, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, man, I say, I tell you, what are we talking about down here in the chat? Let's see here. Uh, real cars, real hair, real air back then, 2017, it wasn't that much different. But yes, it is time machine requests. Big hair, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, let's see what kind of good good stories I got lined up for you here in my uh, magic list of read it laters. Um, you know, <laughs> we'll just start right at the top because I I don't even know what to make of this. It's like this is ridiculous, but here it is, and and uh, so we'll share it with you. This is on the coast to coast am dot com website, coast to coast am. Seinfeld scheme may send man to prison. Apparently, a Michigan man is looking at a potential prison time after plotting to redeem plotting to redeem thousands of bottles and cans what, what's going on there? Bottles and cans as part of a scheme made famous on the sitcom Seinfeld. Brian Everidge was busted in Michigan by Michigan State Police while driving a rental car that contained more than 10,000 empty bottles and cans purchased in Kentucky. A fan of the program Seinfeld uh, may recall characters on the show attempted a similar ruse in order to take advantage of the 10 cent Michigan deposit. Uh, what the legendary episode did not explain is that it is actually illegal to do so. And so the crime comes with a stiff penalty. According to a law in Michigan, it is a felony to attempt to redeem more than 10,000 out-of-state containers and can be punishable by up to five years in prison. And a defense worthy of Jackie Childs, I don't know who that is, um, Everidge's lawyer contends that police caught him attempting to attempt to break the law, and therefore he had not actually committed any crime yet. So somehow, for some reason, uh, unbeknownst to me, it is apparently a crime to take your bottles and cans to another place and redeem them under that state's... Uh, it doesn't make any sense. How does that make sense? Uh, <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> anyway, so apparently that's a Seinfeldian thing. Um, I never watched too many Seinfelds, and I don't recall that particular episode. Um, 
<laughs> so anyway, whatever. <laughs> exactly, Beth. What the hell makes sense these days? Uh, not that. That's for sure. Okay. Let's quit moving around. Sometimes these sites, you know, you load them up and they start moving around on you. You're trying, trying to figure out where the hell you're at. Uh, okay, apparently... Um, you might want to be like a, like a Superman type person, and that I guess apparently is a, a, a closer possibility now, a closer possibility. Uh, from Gizmodo.com, uh, posted today, uh, wearable muscle stimulators can speed up human reflexes to create instant superheroes. That's right, you could be a superhero. Well, not really. <laughs> Says it's hard not to be envious of Spider-Man's ability to dodge attacks using his superhuman reflexes. Does he do that? I thought he just shot webs out of his hands. I didn't know he had superhuman reflexes. Anyway, when you when you still drop your toast on the floor some mornings, yeah, you don't really feel like you got the best reflexes in the world. And I can't recall dropping my toast on the floor. Anyway, but a radioactive spider bite might not be the only way to gain superhuman reflexes. Because researchers have demonstrated a method of supercharging human reflexes by using a combination of sensors and well-timed electric, electrical muscle stimulations. Yes, more gen more genders will be needed. <laughs> uh, anyway, so the average human, that would be you and I, the average human, can react to visual stimulus in about a quarter of a second. So when your eyes notice a mosquito buzzing around your head, it takes about 250 milliseconds for your arm to raise and swat it away. Your brain spends the majority of that time, about 200 milliseconds, 80%, uh, processing what it sees, deciding what to do, and then sending the signal for your body to react. The last 50 milliseconds is how long it takes for your human muscles to actually spring into action and do what your brain has told them to do. The combination of the two represents a human's reaction time, and researchers at the University of Chicago and Sony CSL Research Laboratory in Tokyo have devised a rudimentary way of chopping down the, that baseline reaction time. In a series of simple experiments that involved catching a dropped marker, uh, photographing a, a high-speed object in motion, and shooting a baseball out of the air, the researchers used a combination of sensors to detect the event and, con and connected electrical muscle stim stimulators to a trigger uh, as a reaction to the, in the subject. Uh, the goal of the research, however, was not to make the subjects feel like puppets being controlled by the hardware. Would you really feel like a superhero if you were just along for the ride while somebody else was remotely controlling your body? Of course not. Though, through trial and error, researchers found that by limiting the activation of the electrical muscle stimulators to around 160 milliseconds after the trigger event, the subject's reaction time could be sped up by almost 80 milliseconds, while still making them feel like they were in complete control of their bodies. In reality, their movements were completely controlled uh, by the all by all the hardware that they were wired into or was wired into them as the case may be uh, but because they were concentrating on the same task during the experiment the timing between their natural reactions and the artificially triggered ones was close enough to fool them and the thinking they had done it themselves the idea however of slipping into a specialized suit that enhanced the wearer's reflexes is tantalizing for, you know, maybe for comic book fans. But the research has a long way to go before vigilantes with bona fide superpowers will be roaming the streets. The experiments were limited to a very specific and single event. If the test subjects had changed their minds at the last minute, it would not have made any difference. The reactions would have been the same. The system would have... 
take into account their near unlimited number of variables and stimuli to be truly effective and replicate something like Spider-Man's Spidey Sense. Anyway, um, I, I'm, I'm going to probably pass on having things wired into me that automatically do things that I'm not necessarily in control of. Uh, it doesn't sound like um, uh, something I want, a, a road I want to go down. Um, but, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, now, I saw somebody posted this next link into the chat today, or uh, one from another place. I think it was Rome's posted it from uh, one of those left-wing sites. I forget which one. But I found it yesterday, or the day before, over on Activist Post. Um, and so I'm going to share that one with you, uh, because, well... There's things to say about this. Yes, indeed, there are. <laughs> All right. The Pentagon, the war makers of war, the mongers of war, want 16-year-old kids to fight the Empire's wars. Fun. Lovely. The Pentagon is desperate. Far too many millenni millennials are criminals, so luring them into becoming the latest crop of bullet stoppers for the state is a non-starter. Solution? Recruit 16-year-olds. Most have, have yet most have yet graduated I guess that's proper wording uh, to petty and violent crime although a lot of them are in video game training for a future of violence and self-destructive stupidity. Oh, it's not just kids, let me tell you that. It's not being widely reported in the media. Recruiters are ready to go after 10th graders. They are itching to snag kids before they engage in a life of crime. Yeah, that's the story they're using. Of course, they just want, they just need new meat for the grinders is what that comes down to. Uh, free and slave says Israel used to go for 15 year olds they probably still do I, I, I don't know um, anyway it says or before they have a fully fully mature brains well some of them and decide to kill and be killed isn't much of a career choice first though the state will have to give those little darlings the right quote unquote right to vote for a crop of hand-picked carnival barkers euphemistically called representatives of the people. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I was 16, all I thought about was cruising in my father's car with a freshly minted state permission to drive. Uh, no, I, I was not thinking about that at 16. At 16, I was uh, not... Uh, I, I didn't have a father with a car. I was not living with my parents. And, um, yeah, no, no. Uh, anyway, uh, he was, he says with his, uh, state permission to drive, uh, in his wallet, and he searched desperately for girls willing to make out in the back seat. Well, I had an apartment, so I could just take it back there. <laughs> and I didn't really have to desperately search for him back then either. <laughs> there were plenty. They were, uh, plenty. Anyway, uh, he, the, the author goes on, it took a year or two before I was politically aware, most as a result of Richard Nixon's plan to draft me, polite speak for slavery, into the meat grinder he inherited from LBJ, a.k.a. the Vietnam War, where I would either be minced, traumatized for life, or lucky enough to stay behind the lines and scrub latrines while other kids fought and senselessly died. Around this time, college, high school students, and millions of other concerned Americans marched against the war, a truly remarkable one-time event now impossible in America because the military is quote-unquote volunteer and our wars are quote-unquote humanitarian. Most of these so-called volunteers joined the military because they had so few other career options, if you consider killing other people a career choice. 
uh, brought up in the largely single-parent homes and taught all manner of nonsense in public schools that now resemble lockdown prisons. These quote-unquote volunteers are completely ignorant of the reason the state needs them to fight and die. It's all about the psychopathic dominance of the tiny elite. The elite, uh, calling them elites really a slap in our own face. They're not elite, but whatever. The elite doesn't send its Harvard-bound kids into the neoliberal meat grinder because so many of these silver spoon darlings have bone spurs and such. But this system is breaking down, mostly because the state upholds standards that worked well in the 1940s and 50s, but are completely irrelevant now. They insist it's not permissible to fill the empty ranks with criminals. Hired killers must be held to the highest moral standard. Let me just repeat that sentence for you. Hired killers must be held to the highest moral standard. <laughs> Holy moly. Uh, anyway, so unlike, uh, or so like the United Kingdom... The United States is looking to 16-year-old kids to fight in the name of the corporate state and, of course, our freedom to live hand-to-mouth in a political and cultural cesspool. Democrats like the idea of 16-year-old voters. Most are far more impressionable and less cantankerous than your average middle-aged deplorable. They also approve of the idea of feeding kids into the military but you don't hear a lot about that because Democrats and progressives don't think much about war, although they start most of them. It is a big blind spot for them. There are more important issues. Uh, for instance, transgender bathrooms. Oh, so much more important, yes. I don't think this is going to turn out like they think it will. Far too many 16-year-olds will flunk out of basic training. Most don't have what it takes. Uh, never mind all those formative years of killing bad guys on computer screens. If the Donald gets us into a bigger shooting war over in the Middle East or in South China Sea, the mandatory servitude of conscription will be required. It won't be a turkey shoot like Iraq or Libya. It will be an existential threat, so all males, criminally inclined or not, between the ages of 16 and 45, thankfully I'm well past that, will be inducted, same as they were after FDR tricked the Japanese into invading Pearl Harbor. Or Johnson said the North Vietnamese attacked one of our warships in the Gulf of Tonkin. But the kids are oblivious. They were taught to be so. Uh, they were forced to be so. And the propaganda machine will tell them they are sacrificing their lives or limbs, or mental health, or all of the above, uh, for the noble cause of the star-spangled democracy, which most of them don't know jack about. Uh. <laughs> anyway, Kurt Nimmo wrote that article uh, over there, and uh, was posted on uh, Activist Post, so um, yeah, very well done, Kurt, and, and you are a good writer. I've, I've read many of your posts at various times, and uh, yeah, I, I, I like Kurt and, and what he's got to say on the matter. Uh, let's see what's going on over here in the, the chat. Bible. Basic instructions before leaving Earth. Yeah, well, maybe if you got got like a pocket Bible or something, it'll stop a bullet coming for you. I, I don't know. Uh, but let's see here. Um, initial, re best says initial reason for neocons after... Because after the anti-war, both sides were anti-war, and they could have not had that that anymore. All right, yeah. Um, so yeah, they're talking about the uh, war stuff there, and yeah. Uh, oh, um, let's see, uh, Bessie says for her 16 was uh, what me is was grade every grade get the paper or not not get pregnant as uh, your boyfriend did and leave. Oh, well, that was nice of him. <laughs> not 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 that it was not typical but it was uh yeah anyway we're gonna play some more music right here <laughs> left home two weeks i i left home it was uh i guess the middle middle of the uh 
tenth grade. I was I was sixteen at the time, um, and uh, yeah, my parents and I, my mother and stepfather, I should say, not parents necessarily, uh, uh, that we um, we we didn't really see eye to eye, and I, it was it was. It was they left me alone for the most part, but when I was there, they didn't like me there. I think that's basically what it came down to, is they didn't really want me around. <laughs> they tried to drop me off before. <laughs> anyway, we're going to play some more music, as I said. This is, these are old things. I'm not sure who this person is. Uh, the name is Kyrie Leeson. So, some Irish uh, song, I imagine. There you go. Enjoy. Oh yeah, that there was uh, Samuel L. Jackson singing Stacko Lee from the movie Black Snake Moan. Uh, it was Christina Ricci there dancing on the dance floor in that club. Uh, I liked that movie, that was a good movie. Anyway, before that, we had Joe Bonamassa doing Black Lung Heartache live at the Vienna Opera House. And we kicked it off with, I told you it was Kylie Ellison, but that was apparently the name of the song. The band is called Fate's Warning. <laughs> told you I didn't know who these old band, <laughs> who this old stuff was there. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, we're still stuck back in 2017 here on the request list here. Uh, in this next set, by the way, we do have requests coming up from uh, Miss Beth Z and from Mr. Free Enslaved from back in 2017. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you probably all don't remember requesting these songs. I would imagine, anyhow. You probably don't remember requesting these songs. Because um, <laughs> it was a little while ago. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, where are we at here? Where are we at? Where are we at? But maybe you will remember. That, that'll that be the challenge uh, when I when I get to the next set here. Uh, but uh, till then, you'll have to... Uh... Oh, look at that. They're all... All right. Cool. Um, never mind. Don't mind me. I'm talking to myself. Well, I'm talking to y'all, but I'm talking to myself, too. I do that. I do that a lot, actually. I talk to myself, I talk to the garden, I talk to the whatever. You know, whatever happens to be in front of me, I'm talking to it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, this is big news. This is big and important news for you. But there's a reason I don't believe it, and probably not for the reason that your average folk out there don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good thing, Beth. I think, especially for us folks that live alone, you know, yeah, you just you, you gotta make sure your voice is still working. <laughs> I guess. Anyway, on SputnikNews dot com here, conspiracy theorist claims Nessie's Nessie's escaped Scottish lake amid a heat wave as shapes caught on video. Nessie. No, not Nessie. Nessie multiple. That's right. The extremely hot weather that is making people all across Europe, from Italy to the Netherlands and the UK suffer, has turned out to have some peaks or perks, I should say, for enthusiasts striving to prove that the legendary Loch Ness Monster exists. They suggest that climate change might have affected the mysterious creature as well. Now, I believe Nessie's there. At least one Nessie, if not multiple Nessies. But I certainly don't believe that climate change has done anything because I don't believe that climate change is an actual thing beyond the natural normal cycle of climate. It's certainly not a man-made phenomenon. Anyway, the two blurry figures moving across the Urquhart Bay, one of the most famous lakes on Earth, Loch Ness, 
have been caught on grainy footage. It's always such grainy footage where Nessie's concerned. By a field webcam stationed by uh, research enthusiast Miko Takala, his fellow monster hunter from Ireland, Ioan Ofadwagna, uh, spotted what may, what may have been not one, but two Nessies. Two, count them. That's right. Uh, when he watched the broadcast on the 10th of July, the Sun reports, according to him, uh, that both were on about six meters long and poked out of the water. I have never seen two objects so close to each other on the webcam before, and I have been watching for years. Their shape in the water is very strange. What are they? I don't know. They could be two Nessies. The Loch Ness Watcher, who claims to have seen the legendary creature four times, including three this year alone. He insisted that the two strange shapes were identical to each other and were going in the same direction, prompting him to conclude that they were two separate objects. As the outlet, however, points out, uh, apart from the from the two strange looking shapes a larger object can be seen on the footage that resembles a boat this, this casts a version of that there might be two Nessies in uh, to doubt Takala whose camera caught Nessie's alleged appearance has suggested that the heat wave now scorching Europe might be what could force the mysterious creatures to come closer to humans there has been a slight increase in surface temperatures in Loch Ness due to climate change. No, not due to climate change. Due to hot weather. <laughs> it's climate change bullshit. Anyway, it is possible that a cold-blooded creature like a Nessie may be encouraged to return or stay longer in the warming waters of Loch Ness. The man who was watched, who has watched the lake for more more than 20 years concluded the number of shapes caught on the video did not surprise him either I've always believed that there has to be a family of unknown creatures in the lock albeit a small one it's uh, too much of a stretch to believe that a single creature can live for hundreds if not thousands of years or more he claimed so yeah Nessie's multiple multiple Nessies cruising along Cruise, cruising along <laughs> climate change if you want if you want some conspiracy theory you need to talk about the climate change bullshit because uh <laughs> yeah. because because that's the only conspiracy theory going on there climate change nonsense <laughs> And since we're on the creature features at this point in time, I will get to this one here for you. Hopefully this video doesn't start playing on me. Yes, stop. Stop your video. All right. <laughs> Apparently, I don't know, and I don't know how they verified this, but it says verify. No. Flushing drugs down the toilet will not create meth gators. <laughs> Mass gators. Oh man. <laughs> A Facebook post has people talking. New Orleans. Uh, a, a, a Facebook post from the Tennessee Police Department has people all over talking. The Loretta Police Department posted a picture that included a reference to meth gators. <laughs> so is it a real thing? It sounds pretty crazy. However, the post says officers were searching a man's home when they caught him trying to flush methamphetamine and other items down the toilet. So they wanted to remind people about the danger of that, fearing the wildlife uh, that, that visit their treatment ponds would ingest it. It would also say it also says if it traveled further than the ponds, it could create mess gators, which got a reaction from people. So the big question is, can this happen? 
Eyewitness News reached out to Luann White, a toxicologist at Tulane University, and Dr. Jaime Torres, a veterinarian at the Audubon Society Institute, to get their thoughts. White says it's never good to flush things down toilets, especially drugs, because it all ends up in our water system. However, it's not uncommon. And while it's possible for animals to ingest the contaminated water, their chances of being affected by them is low. Uh, for something like methamphetamines, this is metabolized and broken down. So putting some in there, you're, you're not going to get a meth gator, <laughs> she said. <laughs> for one dilution, <laughs> for one, the dilution is such that the concentration will be low, and the other is that the methamphetamine and many other pharmaceutical drugs are rapidly broken down, so they don't stay in the environment very long times. Eyewitness News also spoke with Torres, who said the same thing, that in order to see the effects, uh, effects of drug and methamphetamine consumption, the gator would probably have to be given it directly. So if you see a snorting gator out there, <laughs> even though they're not sure how, to re how it would respond. While, while I do think it's possible from a theoretical standpoint, when you look at the dilution factors of the drugs being flushed down our toilets and getting into the water supply, the gators would have to ingest a fairly large volume of water to get the effects of the methamphetamine. We don't always see the same effects in mammals and birds and reptiles. Uh, there's no rule that says a turtle exposed to meth wouldn't respond the same way as a gator does. So while it can't be completely ruled out, we can verify that it's next to impossible to create meth gators flushing down by flushing drugs down the toilet. So I think your uh, copper wiring in your house is probably safe from these meth gators. <laughs> <laughs> with any luck anyway <laughs> oh god <laughs> uh. oh and as I was talking about before on the Nessie article and I've talked about oh well I pretty much talk about every time I come onto the, this radio here and talk about anything I, I, I do happen across one or two or more articles that talk about this topic in a more reasonable and logical sense. This article posted on principa-scientific.org yesterday by Francis Menton. Even morons, even your basic high school kid these days, millennials, if they actually looked, could understand. Even non-scientists can see that global warming science, quote-unquote science, is fake. If you follow the subject of the global warming alarmists, uh, you will have read many times before that there is a consensus of 97% of climate sense scientists on, well, on something. Mescator 4, payback time. Good one, Goob. <laughs> and suppose that it consists of some kind of definitive assertion that there has been significant atmospheric warming over the past century, and that most uh, to all of such warming has been caused by human greenhouse gas emissions. Is this real science or fake science? How do you tell? It seems that the most common approach of most people to this question is to trust the scientists. After all, science is tough, science is hard, science is complicated, and you are not a scientist. Scientist. So how are you ever going to understand this? And even if you are a scientist in some other field, and you have both the talent and interest to delve into the details on how this conclusion was reached. You just don't have the time. You are told that 97% of climate scientists agree. Really? What choice do you have? 
uh, other than to trust these people who have done the work, who call themselves scientists and the experts on this subject. This approach apparently seems reasonable to a lot of people, to most people, including many, many seemingly intelligent people. But not to me. The approach does not seem reasonable to me because, very simply, and let me say this clearly and without any, any question in my mind, the scientific method provides a very simple check for testing whether scientific claims are valid and you don't need to be a scientist to apply this check. Another way of looking at it is that uh, people who apply this check are actually the real scientists because they are the ones using the scientific method and the people who call themselves scientists and work in scientific fields of endeavor and publish in scientific journals and wear scientist outfits but don't apply, apply the actual scientific method, they are not really scientists. They're not even close to being scientists. They're liars. But at this point in time, the label scientist has been so captured by those who apply it to themselves whether or not they follow the scientific method I think it's hopeless to get it back. Here's a very simple check. When confronted with a claim that a scientific proposition has been definitively proven, ask the question, what was the null hypothesis? And on what basis has it been rejected? Consider first an example, a simple example. The question of whether aspirin cures headaches. Make that our scientific proposition. Aspirin cures headaches. How would this proposition be established? You, yourself, have taken an aspirin many times, and your headache always went away. Doesn't that prove that the aspirin worked? No, absolutely not. The fact that you took aspirin a hundred times, and the headache went away a hundred times, proves nothing. Why? because there is a null hypothesis that must first be rejected. Here, is the null, here the null hypothesis is that headaches will go away just as quickly on their own. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I lost my spot here. <laughs> where, where, where did I go there? Um, okay. Uh, but uh, uh, how do you reject that? The standard method method is to take some substantial number of people with headaches, say 2,000, and give half of them an aspirin and the other half a placebo. Two hours later, of the 1,000 who took the aspirin, 950 feel better and only 50 still have a headache. And of the 1,000 who took the placebo, 500 still have the headache. Now you have a very very good proof that aspirin cured the headaches. The point to, to focus on is the most important evidence. The only evidence that really proves causation is the evidence that requires rejection of the null hypothesis. Over to the climate science. Here you are subject to a constant barrage of information designed to convince you of definitive relationship between human carbon emissions and global warming. The world temperature graph is shooting up in a hockey stick formation. Arctic sea ice is disappearing. The rate of the sea level rise is accelerating. Hurricanes are intensifying. June was the warmest month ever. And on, and on, and on. All of this is alleged to be consistent with the hypothesis of global human caused global warming, anthrop anthropogenic global warming, if you will. But what is the null hypothesis? And on what basis has it been rejected? Here's the null hypothesis is that some other factor or combination of factors rather than human caused carbon emissions was the dominant cause of the observed warning warming. Once you pose the null hypothesis, 
you immediately realize that all of the scary climate information, boogie boogie man climate information, with which you are constantly barraged, does not even meaningfully address the relevant question. All of that information is just an analog of your 100 headaches that went away after you took an aspirin. How do you know that the headaches wouldn't have gone away without the aspirin? Huh? Huh? You don't know unless someone presents data that are sufficient to reject the null hypothesis. Proof of causation can only come from disproof of the null hypothesis or hypotheses. That is, disproof of other proposed alternative causes. The precept is fundamental to the scientific method, and therefore fully applies to climate science, to the extent that the field wishes to be real science versus fake science. Now, start applying the simple check to every piece you read about climate science. Start looking for a null hypothesis and how it was supposedly rejected. In mainstream climate literature, and I'm including here both highbrow media like the New York Times <coughs> and the so-called peer-reviewed scientific journals like Nature and Science, you won't find it. It seems that people calling themselves climate scientists today have convinced themselves that their field is such settled science that they no longer need to bother with tacky questions like worrying about the scientific method and null hypothesis. The centrality of focusing on the null hypothesis is the reason that studies like those covered in his last post, uh, Things Keep Getting Warmer for the Fake Science of Human-Caused Global Warming, are so important. When climate scientists start addressing the alternative hypothesis seriously, then it will be a real science. In the meantime, it's nonsense. Fake science. A final word about my fi favorite subject, the ongoing systematic liter alteration of the world's surface temperature, ground thermometer-based records. Readers here are undoubtedly familiar with his now 23-part series, The Greatest Scientific Fraud of All Time. The alteration of surface temperature records only relates to making this surface temperature record correlate more closely to the increase in atmospheric CO2. It has nothing to do with CO2 making the temperature rise. As noted at the Wallace et al. paper, Without the alterations, the correlation between atmospheric CO2 and surface temperature record is low and practically non-existent. In other words, without faking the data, they can't even show consistency between atmospheric CO2 and temperature increase. And that's before even getting down to dealing with the problem of it being actual science using a null hypothesis. <laughs> oh, love it, love it, love it. So there you have it, scientist alarmist, global warming alarmist. <clears throat> Your nonsense is nonsense. Nothing more. Nothing more. <laughs> See what's going on here in the chat here. Oh, uh, Beth says she just asked the greenies how many uh, how many greenhouse gases are there, and what uh, what dollar sign? It's, oh, I think she meant percent. What percent is CO two? So far, only one person has gotten one of those right in fifteen years. It's, uh, for the first thing he looked up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the greenies, the, the global warming alarmists believe in their programming absolutely, totally, 100% uncritically. And that is logic. And uh, logic to them is not real. And the scientific method cannot be used because, well, they're not really scientists. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> uh, I love it when, a, uh, when, when, when the facts actually come out and smack them in the face. Not that they would actually read that, or they would actually buy into it. They don't they would actually believe the information presented to them. They don't care 
about the scientific method being used. They don't care that their stuff has has they they could never disprove a null hypothesis. They they just don't care. They don't care that the data was faked. They know the data was faked, and they don't care. <laughs> Oh man, I I tell you, it, it's just um, uh, hmm. all right. We'll get to some of this other stuff next time around. I think here, um, yeah, because we got some weird stuff going on that that doesn't really fit with that particular story. So we'll play some more music. Oh wait, we could we could. I, I shared this with Grammy the other night the other day, and she shared it on her blog or or her uh, her show. So I'm I'm just going to tell you it, that you need to listen to Grammy's show from Wednesday, and and you'll hear um, uh, Charles Hugh Smith of TwoMinds.com uh, talking about this thing here because it's not just, of course, the climate nonsense is fake. It's not just the news that's fake. Everything is fake. If if you didn't hear her show on Wednesday, uh, de absolutely check out her show. And, and she read through this whole article here. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll give you the first paragraph here. Uh, it says that we that that we fall for cons is understandable, given that's all we have left in the public sphere. We fall for cons because there's nothing else to hear. What do we mean when we say corporate media is fake? We mean it's a carefully crafted con, a set of narratives, cherry picked data and heavily massaged statistics, the unemployment rate, etc., designed to instill, instill the reader's confidence in a narrative that serves the interest not, on, not of the citizenry, but of the select few pillaging the citizenry. Anyway, the, the article's uh, not that long, but it, it's, um, it has some graphs and stuff in here, and I, I think you should just read this and or probably, possibly, preferably listen to Grammy's show, uh, Grammy's podcast from Wednesday, either on reallibertymedia.com under the podcast there, or uh, from, from her, her, her podcast blog, or on our BitChute site. Um, yeah, it, it's available in other places as well, but uh, yeah, that, 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 that should do it. That should do it. So, um, everything's fake. Everything's fake. I've been saying that how long? How long have I been telling you? Everything's fake. <laughs> not, not that I'm any kind of a, a, a fear of any kind, other than the fact that I can see what the hell's going on and and know that it's all bullshit. So yeah, everything is fake, and um, certainly the climate change, uh, 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 anthropogenic global warming, anthropogenic climate change is absolutely. 100% fake nonsense that, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to play some more music right here. Um, uh, again, these are requests from uh, 2017, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy them. Uh, yeah, little Frank Zappa there for y'all. Yes, indeed. Uh, that there was a... Free and Slave request from 2017, Dirty Love. Before that, a Beth Z request from 2017, Crazy by Scott and Amy. Amy Allen, by the way. She is now, by the way, a, uh, uh, Amy Interrupter, as she is part of the Interrupters, and she goes by that. And we kicked it off with Stevie Ray Vaughan and uh, Double Trouble doing Couldn't Stand the Weather. Uh, Beth Z is asking, I, I, I typed into the chat, dot MLB, and to which the bot Vanna White gives all of the Major League Baseball scores. And the reason I did that, not that I give a crap about the Major League Baseball, is that Moose Girl went to the, the uh, Mousetrap uh, bar there in, in Eau Claire this evening to watch on the television uh, the Milwaukee-Chicago Cubs game. And Milwaukee won 3-2, to so she's probably happy about that, I would assume, I would imagine. Um, so, hooray, Moose Girl! <laughs> oh, anyway. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we're gonna move on to uh May of twenty seventeen now. 
in, 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 instead of April. <laughs> uh, the, the time machine is getting closer. Not that much, but a little bit. <laughs> so, in this next set, we'll have requests from uh, Trust No One and Kate from May of 2017. So, uh, yeah. Hey, by the way, howdy, Hansel. Howdy, Goober. Welcome to the show. I don't know if you were, how long Goober's been around here or, or in here in the chat during the show. But, uh, yeah, he's here. And also, uh, Hansel just joined us. So, um, yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome, guys. Glad to have you here on board on the Balls to the Wall program. All right, <laughs> big screens and beer. Yeah, I think that's. I don't. I don't know how big the screens are there, but I imagine they're big enough for the whole bar to watch. So yeah, cool. <laughs> oh man, let's see what else I got here for you. That'll. Uh, we'll get back to that one in a minute. Okay, this one here. We'll do this. This one here next. Um. This was posted on WISN.com, and I just have to wonder why. Why? Maybe somebody get it. Some people get it. I don't get it. Even if it's true, even if the, the statement is true, why are you doing this? In God We Trust. Going up at South Dakota Public Schools. That's correct. When students return to public schools across South Dakota this fall, they should expect to see a new message on display. In God We Trust. A new state law that took effect this month requires all public schools in the state, uh, 149 directs, to paint stencil, or otherwise prominently display the national motto. Is that actually the national motto? Vinny came back. Hey, it is Vinny. He came in so easily slid under the radar. The South Dakota lawmakers who proposed the law said the requirement was meant to inspire patriotism. As if that's a good thing. In the state's public schools, displays must be at least 12 by 12 inches, so the size of an LP, uh, a record, uh, for you young folks, a vinyl record, <laughs> and must be approved by the school's principal according to the law. Associated school boards of the South Dakota Executive Director, Wade Pogani, said schools are complying with the law in different ways. Some have plaques. Others have it painted on the wall. Maybe in a mural setting, Pogani said. In one school, it was within their freedom wall that they added to a patriotic theme. So apparently they somehow associate patriotism with freedom. I do not. I associate patriotism with slavery to the state. But they think patriotism is somehow associated with freedom. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, based in Madison, Wisconsin, which has legally challenged the motto's inclusion on currency, alerted its South Dakota members to contact their legislators to express opposition to the law. I don't necessarily see it as a big deal one way or the other, um, but uh, to force people to do it? Eh. Since our position is that it's a terrible violation of freedom of conscience to inflict a godly message on a captive audience of school children. Foundation co-president Ann Laurie Gaylor said on Wednesday. Um, one thing it doesn't really say, though, is in God we trust. It doesn't say what God. Does it? No, 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 it doesn't. 
Pogani said the school board's association was okay with legislation as long as it provided a legal protection. <laughs> I don't even, what does that even mean? <laughs> Uh, one of our concerns was that th this would be contested. So we had asked the legislatures not to put a hold on a harmless clause into the bill. The, the state would then defend the schools and pay the cost of the defense. Administrators at Rapid City Area Schools have finished stenciling the motto. They keep calling it a motto. I, I don't know that that's a motto. How is that a motto? Anyway, on the walls of its 23 public schools, the law does not provide funding for installing the message. Stenciling the motto costs a total of $2,800 at Rapid City Schools. Uh, in May, a group of students from the District Stevens High School suggested the school board to the school board an alternate version of the motto that they designed that includes the names of Buddha, Yahweh, and Allah as well as terms like science and spirit. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> so, so wait. <laughs> in spirits we trust? I don't know. In science we trust? Uh, uh, in Buddha we trust? I, I don't know. The student group working to, and, and Buddha never considered himself to be a god, by the way, for any of you that are interested and didn't know that. Yeah, Buddha never, and, and, and Buddha was an enlightened person. But uh, that's where it started and ended with Buddha. Uh, anyway, so whatever. The student group working to initiate societal equality, or WISE, working to initiate societal equality, told the board members that the standard motto appears to favor Christianity over other religions. Now, I could be wrong, but... I think Yahweh and Allah are also references to the same God that the Christian and Jewish uh, folks believe in and, and follow and whatever. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's all the same God. Uh, yeah, anyway, to my knowledge, there's been no discussion among the board about any alternative, Urban said. In God we trust was, oh, here, here it is, here's where it becomes a motto. Uh, in God We Trust was adopted when uh, President Eisenhower signed legislation in 1956, according to the U.S. Department of Treasury website, when it first appeared on money. So it, since it's the thing that's printed on money that is the national motto, and you're saying, in God we trust, you're basically saying, in the U.S. dollar we trust, which is not even a U.S. dollar. It's in the Federal Reserve debt notes we trust. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> Oh, it's all just funny. It's all just funny. <laughs> all right, let's, let's just do a little bit about this. Oh, I should have covered that one earlier. Oh, let's just do this one now before we get to that other one. Uh, I mean, I mean, and I should have covered this before when I was talking about the climate science is not science. Uh, but here it is. For those of you asking, wondering... Possibly, is this possibly, is this the warmest year? Was June the hottest month uh, on record? Is that possible? Well, no. No, it's not. <laughs> History shows that the warmest U.S. decade on record was the 1930s. On record was the 1930s. That don't mean it is the warmest decade ever, because we certainly, we don't know. We didn't have measuring instruments long before then. And and so we, we can't say what the warmest decade ever was, but it certainly was not now. 
This was long before the industry admitted significant amounts of carbon dioxide, says Stephen Gorham. According to the NOAA, 23 of the 50 state record high temperatures were recorded in the 1930s. 36 of 50 state record highs occur, uh, occurred prior to 1960. They got a little map here showing you uh, when, when each um, state had reached its highest temperature record. Uh, and uh, for New Mexico, New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, and Nevada, it was, all of those were in 1994. But California, 1913, uh, Oregon, 19, uh, 1898, uh, Oregon, uh, Washington, 1961, uh, Idaho, uh, other states, a uh, bunch of other states, 1936. Um, so, yeah, no, this is, anyway. But never mind such inconvenient facts. 74 of U.S. <laughs> 74 U.S. medical and public health groups released a U.S. call to action last month in which they declared climate change to be a true public health emergency. They also claimed that we urgently need to transition away from hydrocarbon energy and move to a new low-carbon economy. Trouble is, actual weather and health trends don't support either of those alarms or demand actions. Last week, temperatures in Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania peaked at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But these temperatures were far below the state record highs which were Iowa, 118 degrees in 1934, Illinois, 117 in 1954, Indiana, 116 in 1936, Ohio, 113 in 1934, and Pennsylvania, 111 in 1936. Go Gorham goes on to eviscerate the false claims of increasing storm, drought, flood, hurricane, and tornado activity even a wildfire activity. The belief that changing light bulbs, driving electric cars, and erect erecting wind turbines can improve human health as <laughs> is as medieval as the belief that bloodletting can cure disease. Gorham concludes. <laughs> yes, it's all nonsense. But science, bah! Who needs science? Science is nonsense. You don't need no freaking science. We got we got paid for, bought and paid for people that claim to be scientists telling you what what the real information is. Oh man. <laughs> All right. Okay, here we go. On to this one. On to this lovely uh, website here. And though the website is conservapedia.com, so it's a conservative version of Wikipedia, uh, apparently. And uh, so I, I came across this the other day when over there on Twitter for many hours, uh, a hashtag was trending throughout the day, which was hashtag Clinton body count. And somebody uh, linked up this this particular uh, uh, website here. It's the Clinton body count entry on the conservapedia.com website. The Clinton body count originated with the 1987 Ives Henry uh, Henry double homicide case and the subsequent violent deaths of seven witnesses or suspects in the investigation. Drug smuggling continued at the Mina Airport after the CIA terminated the Contra Supply operation and left Arkansas. All nine of these murders in the vicinity of Mina remain unsolved, and three were originally ruled suicides by the state's chief medical examiner. Law enforcement and prosecutors also participated in the cover-up, some receiving pay raises, and promotions in the Clinton, Arkansas political machine. The BCCI inslaw in small uh, Little Rock Bank, 
uh, data processing company known as Systematics also figure prominently in a string of unusual deaths. Once in the White House, many premature deaths related to, quote, accidents, unquote, most likely as a result of sabotage and, quote, unquote, suicides staged by hired thugs, coincide with investigations into illegal fundraising. Since leaving the White House, several witnesses in corruption probes have been suicided or met bizarre accidents and uh, only days before giving sworn testimony. Other mysterious deaths are related to the Clinton Foundation and fundraising. Much of the early work on the subject was done by journalist Danny Casalaro, I think that's how you say his name, uh, writing The Octopus, and Victor Thorne, author of the Clinton Murder Volume, both of whom met suspicious and untimely deaths. Future researchers will build upon their work with the caveat of associated links. The Clinton body count spawns a neo neologism, neologism? Arkinside, Arkinside, <laughs> defined as neither traditional suicide nor homicide, but suicide by two bullets to the back of the head. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's how I'm going to commit suicide. I'm going to shoot myself twice in the back of the, head, the back of the head. This updated body count is an attempt to list subjects by occupation and the area of inquiry. It is not necessarily chronological or alphabetical. Anyway, they go through and list all kinds of people in this, but uh, most notably, I would say here, uh, back in the beginning, the uh, one that probably, I do believe, uh, started Mike Rivero uh, down the road and where it kicked him off into the website whatreallyhappened.com, Vince Foster. Systematics was a data processing company represented by Hillary Clinton, Vince Foster, and Webb Hubble. Vince Foster, July 20th, 1993, former White House counsel and colleague of Hillary Clinton at a Little Rock, Little Rock's Rose Law Firm died of a gunshot wound to the head ruled as a suicide. Foster was the highest ranking executive branch official since JFK to meet an untimely death while still in office. Under laws passed after the JFK assassination, the FBI should have led an investigation but it was relegated to the United States Park Service and the Department of the Interior. The FBI, without leadership at the time, Clinton having fired the FBI director less than 24 hours before Foster's body was discovered. Vince Foster was an attorney with a professional reputation reputation for integrity and in the early 1980s started uh, cooperating with the Israeli intelligence, but Foster began playing a dangerous game in the mid-80s when he became the link between systematics and the NSA, the main U.S. government agency that was looking for fronts to market the stolen Insla software. Foster had a Swiss bank account and was making one-day trips to Switzerland every six to eight months. Foster was the bag man for the Arkansas political machine. Less than five months into the Clinton administration first term, on July 1st, 1993, Foster purchased a round-trip tick to Switzerland. This prompted surveillance by the CIA counterintelligence, NSA, FBI, and the four, a four-person IRS team, putting a tremendous amount of psychological pressure on him. Foster became alarmed that he was under investigation, when he phoned ahead of time and discovered the Swiss bank account had been drained of the $2.73 million deposited there. The account had been drained by ex-CIA hackers who placed the funds in escrow account for the CIA. Foster uh, hired James Hamilton, a high-powered Washington lawyer specializing in white-collar crime who handles cases before congressional committees. The weekend meeting was uh, held with Webster Hubble and both their wives and at the estate of Michael Cordoza, 
who later headed the Clinton Legal Defense Fund. George Stephanopoulos is also said to be at the meeting. Okay. 286000 was deposited into the account of Vince's wife, uh, Lisa Foster, shortly before the meeting. The money was paid evidently as hush money and for legal fees. The hope apparently was that Foster would not break under stress and name names of others in the Clinton administration. <laughs> anyway, I'll let you read this because it, it goes on quite a bit. It talks about William Kobe, the uh, uh, very inslaw and the systematics, uh, uh, the, the Waco massacre and how that all ties in. White Water, of course, huge. Uh, the Clinton murder volume, Michael Hastings, uh, Jenny Moore, Peter Smith, uh, all, all kinds of names in here. Dan Danny Eisman, Joan, John Crawford, excuse me, not Joan, um, <laughs> talks about the mean airport, witnesses, uh, all, all kinds of various stuff. Um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. All of the information and evidence tied back uh, to, to the whole Clinton body count thing there. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite the deal. It's quite the deal that, uh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the, the headline and a, what, what, oh, what did I do? I, I clicked the wrong thing. The headline and just a little bit of this next uh, article and you tell me whether it's true or not. Democrats and Republicans stop fighting just long enough to approve even more crushing debt. It is true. They did exactly that. <laughs> Washington, D.C. In a rare moment of bipartisan unity, Democrats and Republicans came together just long enough to approve spending even more money we don't have plunging the nation even into even more crushing debt. The things we disagree on, Nancy, uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said in an address flanked by Senator Mitch McConnell and President Donald Trump, we don't agree ex on exactly how much money to take away from you. For instance, we don't uh, agree exactly how many foreign countries to bomb at a given time. We don't even agree exactly how much the government should interfere with your personal decisions. But it's really important, she continued, for us to come together to approve the borrowing of trillions of dollars that your grandkids will have to pay back. Trump nodded thoughtfully throughout Pelosi's speech and was asked if he wanted to say anything. Huh? Oh, I wasn't listening. I was thinking of something else. <laughs> Senator McConnell jumped in to say a few words. Nancy Pelosi and I might not see eye to eye, but we'll always set aside our differences to spend future generations' money. Also, war. We'll come together for war. We could always use a we could use a good war right now. He then looked off into the distance dreamily. <laughs> <coughs> With the debt ceiling out of the way, also true, by the way, the debt ceiling has been eliminated, at least until July of next year. Um, the politicians in Washington say, the sky's the limit for how much of our future the government can spend away. Now, is that an actual article or not? <laughs> uh those folks over at the Babylon Bee, they, they, they do a fine, fine job on their satire. <laughs> a very fine job on their satire. Oh, man. <laughs> yes, that is a satire article. For those, any of you wondering, however, there is a lot of truth in that article. They did come together and decide to spend as much money as humanly possible, stealing more of your money as humanly possible, spending your kids' money, spending your grandkids' money, spending your great-grandkids' money, and so on and so forth. Uh. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, my God. This is the world we live in. This is the world we live in today. Now, this next article I find to be extremely good news, even if I don't go there. Even if I haven't been to one of these places in I don't know how many years, I think it's a, a, if, it's, if it's setting a trend to where this happens at many more places, I'm good with it. I'm perfectly fine with it, and I hope it happens everywhere. Pizza Hut to test out system where customers never have to interact with an actual person. <laughs> I would be glad to never have to interact with an actual person <laughs> on that on the retail level there like that in, in these kind of places. <laughs> Anyway, Pizza Hut is testing out a way for customers to get pizza without ever having to talk to a person. Uh, the company will be testing out a digital cubby system at one of its locations in Hollywood, California. Customers will be able to order a pizza ahead of time and then pick it up from the appropriate cubby when they arrive at the restaurant. Uh, the cubby system was designed to be an easy alternative for time-strapped carry-out customers. Nation's Restaurant News reported, adding that it won't replace the traditional in-store experience, but work alongside it. The system is expected to work with orders made through the Pizza Hut app, along with others made through the website or in-store. In the statement to Fox News, a spokesman for Pizza Hut said, So many people live on the go and don't have time to wait in line, especially in urban areas. And let's face it, many of us welcome an opportunity to skip the small talk and all the other nasty parts that come with talking to people. Uh, so we took it upon ourselves to introduce this seamless and innovative carryout experience that eliminates the lines, the wait, and the conversation, allowing you to literally grab a fresh hot pizza to go. The system will reportedly have 12 cubbies, once an order is ready, customers can pick it up from the latched cubby that has their name displayed on it. <laughs> Hooray for Pizza Hut. <laughs> the hell with talking to actual humans. <laughs> Who wants that? Oh, man. <laughs> I certainly don't. These, this next article is about actual humans. Actual humans doing actual human things that I don't even really know that it's a problem but really Summit News Summit.News Doctors in the UK forced to tell women women not to put ice lollies in their vaginas to cool down. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, those frozen ice, uh, ice pops. All right. In the UK, heat waves tend to bring out even more stupid behavior that uh, than than that is, uh, which is already rampant. A missed record of temperatures across the country. Doctors are now telling young women. Not to put ice lollies in their vaginas to cool them down. <laughs> yes, really. My advice would be to avoid any foreign bodies in the vagina for risk of infection, said gynecologist Dr. Sri Dada. I would suggest loose cotton underwear to avoid tight clothing to prevent any irritation and dermatitis developing. The sage advice was echoed by Dara, Dr. Sarah Walsh, the co-founder of Hank's condom brand, who cautioned women that putting ice lollies in their private parts could alter the natural pH of the vagina and cause further problems if the object was to break up inside. There are many things that should never go near a vagina, and ice lollies are up there, said Welsh. The ice can stick to the delicate skin of the vagina and cause real trauma and damage. Why such advice should even be necessary 
it's too depressing to consider. <laughs> Just don't don't be sticking ice cubes up your pussy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> All right. Um, a, a little more, a little more uh, serious, important news. Everybody in California is not a total moron. Everybody is not. Many are, but some are not. And these people appear to be on the not side not on the plus side from the LA Times dot com parents who will not vaccinate their kids turning to homeschooling in California if Cardi Lee's daughter had to be fully vaccinated to enroll in school the choice was simple she felt her daughter would not attend school three years ago Lee decided to homeschool her daughter London now seven her daughter's name is London okay uh, instead of complying with the state's vaccination laws. We became a state where they force vaccination, and I was totally against vaccination, said Lee, 34, who lives in Murrieta. In 2016, California implemented one of the strictest immunization laws in the country, requiring that all children be up to date on their vaccinations. Just the phrasing is just maddening up to date on their vaccinations to attend school unless a doctor says otherwise Ugh. anyway they show the home uh, graph here of homeschooled kindergartners without their shots their shots uh, so in 2016 it was around uh, 1400 or so and now it's nearly 7000 the law, however, does not apply to children who are homeschooled. A loophole, they call it, that parents seem to be increasingly exploiting. Exploiting, they call it. Over the past three years, the number of kindergartners who were homeschooled and did not have their shots quadrupled, according to a Times analysis of state data. It is unclear whether parents are opting for homeschooling solely because they want to avoid vaccines. Well, how about the brainwashing? How about wanting to avoid that? Or if they are choosing to homeschool for other reasons and also happen to not want to vaccinate their children. Regardless, there are now thousands of homeschooled children all over the state who do not have their shots. The number that keeps rising every year. And though most of their schooling may take place at home, many are part of programs that meet several times a week with other students. If one contracted a disease such as measles, oh no, not measles, a standard childhood disease that all kids should have, um, they could still spread it at the park or the grocery store or the boogeyman might come and get you or anywhere once they come into contact with other people. These kids are dangerous. Oh, these crazy parents. What is wrong with them? Some kind of madness has spread into their mind. <laughs> I can't even read the rest. Uh, there it is there for you. It's, it's, it's horrifying. Horrifying, I say. <laughs> All right. We're going to play some more music here. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> I, 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 I I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All right. This is from a 2017 request by me. Before you slip into unconsciousness. Yeah, Dr. John there for y'all. Uh, that was a Miss Kate request there. I guess it was originally my request, and then Miss Kate re-requested it. Uh, the song is called Revolution. Rest in peace, Dr. John. Uh, before that, a Mr. Rome's request there 
Iron Maiden doing the evil that men do. And we kick it off with the Doors doing Crystal Ship. All good songs, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say that. I did say that, didn't I? <laughs> oh, man. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't mind me none. Don't mind me none. Where am I at here? Oh, oh, this one too, huh? Oh, okay. All right. All right. I did not realize that. Okay. Well, that's good to, good to, good to know as well. So, uh, yep. And what did Vanna say? Did Vanna say something? I missed it because I can't see because I got the other stuff covering the screen. And I cannot tell what's going on there. <laughs> AI needs upgrading. Well, that's yeah, I'm sure of that. <laughs> All right. Let's see what Vanna had to say here. Uh, oh, uh, error! The request could not be satisfied. Yeah. No, they uh, a lot of these websites they block they block out uh, bots perceived bots, and of course Vanna being a bot is a blocked out from. Well, she's blocked. She. <laughs> oh man, I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got here. I got I got to do a little counting. All right, we'll slide this over to the first. First there. Oops, we got three. We got three. We got eight. Eleven. That's eleven. That's eleven. And three is fourteen. And this fourteen, seventeen. Okay. Good enough. Um, Vanna is a legend. I don't know if you remember. If any of y'all watched the uh, that old TV show, um, Married with Children. It was an episode of Married with Children, uh, in which uh, Vanna White was in it, and apparently, Vanna had in, in the episode anyway, not really, but apparently in the episode, uh, Vanna had been the uh, girlfriend of Al Bundy, sometime back in the day, and then she had become a famous I don't know clothes designer or something. Anyway, she was going to pay um, uh, Peg, the Al's wife, uh, like half a million dollars if she could buy Al from her. <laughs> and of course, no, they didn't. They, it didn't happen in the end because you know uh, they they really do like each other. So, all right. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Here's some tech stories for y'all. Um, uh, the hacker news dot com. For you puts out this posting today. Now I, and probably many of you, uh, use for your office suite for for uh, things um, LibreOffice. LibreOffice, yeah. Uh, but apparently there's a problem with it. Just opening a document in LibreOffice can hack your computer. Unpatched, but it's not just any document, so. Just because there's a little bit of hyperbole there in the headline. Don't get too worried yet. But the article says, Are you using LibreOffice? You should be extra careful about what document files you open using LibreOffice software over the next few days. That's because LibreOffice contains a severe unpatched code execution vulnerability that could sneak malware onto your system as soon as you open a maliciously crafted document file. So it's not your own documents you need to worry about. It's others, people's documents. LibreOffice is one of the most popular and uh, open source alternatives to Microsoft's Office Suite and is available for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS systems. Oh, as well as, well as Android, too. I'm not sure about iPhone, but uh, yeah. Anyway, earlier this month, LibreOffice released the latest version, 6.25, of its software 
that addressed two severe vulnerabilities. But the patch for the former has now been bypassed, uh, security researcher Alex Infraher claims. Though Infraher has not yet disclosed details of the technique that allowed him to bypass the patch, the impact of the vulnerability remains the same as explained below. Anyway, uh, you just read this, and I would suggest that uh, until you, they release the patch for this, um, don't open anybody else's documents in your LibreOffice. Open your own only, uh, be, uh, just just to be safe, you know. Don't just go on the web and grab some LibreOffice documents and and start opening them up. I, I would I would avoid that if I were you, which of course I'm not. <laughs> um, th this next one is kind of cool, um, uh, uh, although it won't affect you unless you decide to go out and and uh, try it out. Um, but it, it seems pretty cool. Um, I have not tried it out yet. I think my router could handle this, but uh, um, and it's based on the same same firmware I, I run on my router. Anyway, Mozilla debuts implementation of WebThings Gateway open source router firmware. I use the DDWRT firmware on my router. Um, most of your routers will accept some kind of uh, aftermarket firmware, which is better than the firmware that's shipped with your routers. And, and you may want to look into that because most of the router software that shipped the firmware that shipped with the routers is highly vulnerable. Um, so anyway, here it is. For the better part of two years, the folks at Mozilla, Mozilla have been diligently chipping away at the Mozilla web things in open implementation of the World Wide Web Consortium's W3C web things, web of things, a standard for monitoring and controlling connected devices. In April, it gained a number of powerful logging, alarm, and network features, and today a revamped component of WebThings, the WebThings Gateway, a privacy and security-focused software distribution for smart home gateways. Um, so experimental builds of the WebThings Gateway 0 0.9 are available on GitHub for the Turris Omina, Omina, Omina router. Uh, with expanded support for routers and uh, developer boards, boards to come down the line. Uh, separately, there's a new build complete uh, with the recently announced Raspberry Pi 4. Mozilla notes that it currently only offers extremely basic router configurations and cautions against replacing so uh, firmware, but the company says uh, that it's note a noteworthy milestone in its path to creating full software distribution for wireless routers. Now, I, I'm kind of excited to see this and am hopeful about it. Um, I do use DDWRT, which is uh, available for thousands of different router brands uh, and models. Um, and so you might want to check out DDWRT. Uh, they also say that this is based on the OpenWRT, uh, which is also very good. But if you have a router that like a, a Linksys or a, a, whatever brand router, um, I, I use a TP-Link. But um, you you probably want to replace your firmware because the the software, like I said, the firmware that's shipped uh, with with your router is not good. It's not only not good feature-wise, but it, but it's not good security-wise, so or privacy-wise. So. Um, you might want to look into uh, some other firmware for your routers just to be safe. And it's not that difficult to do. It really isn't. Uh, it's a little scary, I guess, you know, if you're um, not too uh, up on doing things like that. But it, it's really pretty simple overall. Now, last week or a couple weeks ago, um, it was reported that VLC, and a lot of us use VLC as our audio and and, and or video players uh, on our computers. Um, and it, it is cross-platform all over the place. Um, yeah, the computer's one thing, but your, your router's a different thing altogether. 
Uh, anyway, um, so VLC is a wonderful program. I've been using it for many years now, and I know a lot of you all have as well. Um, but apparently it was reported that there was a critical security issue uh, in VLC player. Nonsense, according to the VLC developers. They say widespread reports of a critical security issue that supposedly impacted users of VLC media player have been debunked as completely bogus by the developers. Earlier this week, computer German, German Computer Emergency Response Team, uh, CERT-BUND, part of the Federal Office for Information Systems, which somehow becomes BSI. I, I don't know how you get BSI out of Federal Office for Information Security, but that's the Germans for you. Um, pushed out an advisory warning network administrators and other users of a high-impact vulnerability in VLC. It seems that the advisory can be traced back to a ticket that was opened by a uh, opened on VLC owner Videoland's public bug tracker more than four weeks ago. The alleged heap-based buffer overflow flaw was disclosed by a user named Topsec, who stated that a malicious MP4 file could be leveraged in an attack to take control of VLC's media user devices. This issue was flagged as high risk by the CERT BUN site and the vulnerability was assigned a CVE entry. However, according to Video Land President Jean-Baptiste Kempf, the exploit does not work on the latest VLC build. In fact, any potential issues relating to the vulnerability were patched more than a year ago. There is no security issue in VLC, Kemp told the Daily Swig in a phone conversation. Uh, this is a security issue in a third-party library, and the fix was pushed out 18 months ago. When asked how or why... Uh, where, where, where did I lose my place at? How or why this oversight generated so much attention... Kempf noted the reporter of the supposed vulnerability did not approach Videoland through its security reporting email address. The guy never contacted us, said Kempf, who remains the lead developer at the VLC project. This is why you don't report security issues on a public bug tracker. Uh, uh, Kempf and his team are unable to replicate the issue with the latest version of VLC. Uh, leading many to believe that the bug reporter was working on a computer running an outdated version of Ubuntu. If you report a security issue, at least update your Linux distribution. At the very least. <laughs> Don't be reporting there's problems with something that's old and outdated. And uh, Anyway. <laughs> All right, I got, I, got, I got to do this last set here. So uh, we'll kick it off with this here right now, and we'll get back to you Oop, after I do these, after, after these happen. Here we go. <laughs> Black Betty. <laughs> I love that version, man. That's a great version there. Christopher Amoroso doing his uh, Black Betty. Before that, we had the Yardbirds for Miss Kate there doing I Wish You Would. And before that was Enter Sandman in the style of David Bowie by a, an account called 10 Second Songs. Really, really cool version of... Uh, Enter Sandman there. He really uh, replicates David Bowie very well in that. And, and uh, yeah, it makes that song very interesting. And he kicked it off with a free enslaved request. Classic 4 doing this spooky. All right. It's going to wrap it up here. But uh, tomorrow you got the dork table at noon Eastern with a flash somebody. And possibly Vinny, possibly Grammy. I don't know who all is going to join in on uh, B Flash's co hostages on the show, but tune in, check it out. It's a fun show. Um, I, I, I will be on Sunday at noon Eastern with the blues right here, Grim, Grim's Blues. 
uh, Grimnier's Blues, possibly. Call it whatever you want. Just call it the Blues, RLM Blues. I don't know. Uh, at noon Eastern, we, I play for three hours, a little over three hours, but that's all right. J just say three hours, uh, noon noon until 3 p.m. Eastern, and we play trivia here in the chat. It's good old time, fun, fun, fun. Uh, followed up immediately at 3 p.m. Eastern by Hal Anthony behind the woodshed, opening up a big old can of whoop ass. Uh, he'll give you some information that you probably could use for something, uh, just general information for you to have, uh, help you uh, get through your your life and it's good and tune in i'll be on again on monday evening at 7 p.m eastern with grim leftovers covering the stories i couldn't get to here and i don't mean when i say i couldn't get to here i don't mean just on this night's show but on on, on shows from weeks past my my uh my list goes back about a month so uh, i got all those uh flash will be on at 2 a.m in the morning Eastern Time on Tuesday with In a Perfect World. Uh, Grammy comes back on at Wednesday on Wednesday at uh, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern with Grammy's Rocket Chair and again on Friday at the same time. Uh, Flash will be on Thursday doing 20% off 2 p.m. Eastern and uh, back around to me. Oh, I don't, I don't think Vinny's coming on on Friday. But uh, you never know. If he does come on, if Vinny does come on Friday, it'll be 1 p.m. Eastern. So uh, keep an eye out or an ear out, I guess, as the case may be. Have a, have a great weekend, everybody. I, I Like I said, I had great fun uh, with y'all. Playing music, talking, chatting, sharing stories. All that fun stuff. Talk to you later. Peace!